Good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Good morning, good morning, good morning. No, I love this. I love the talking. I just, when I used to teach high school, I used to just stand up here and just stare at my students until they'd all quiet down, so. <laughs> um, good morning, it's good to see you all. I can't believe it's already the second week of November. Or is it the second week or third? Second, yeah. Um, I do have a few announcements. So if you wanna pull out your phone and or like a little notepad um, just for you to keep track of them. This weekend, Life Church is hosting a party in the park. So if you live near here, this is a great event for families and kids. They're going to have a petting zoo. They're going to have mini golf, bouncy house, uh, Kona ice, cold brew snacks, and crafts. Uh, this is like right over here is what Weston's telling me. The park over here, I think it's Cal Calbrisa. Yeah. So Calbrisa Park this uh, Saturday from 10 to noon, bring your friends, bring your family, or if you know someone who lives around here with kids who need something to do, uh, send them their way. We posted about it on social media and then we'll post it again uh, this week just to remind you. Shannon will be in tra or traveling to Florida next weekend. Um, she has some Aspire events. So if you know anybody in the, let's see, let me make sure I have this right the Acala, Florida, or Haines City, Florida area. She's going to be speaking there Friday and Saturday. Now, that is a big time zone jump, so be saying some prayers for her as she goes there for three days and then comes back. Uh, and then the following weekend, she's heading back out to the East Coast. She's going to be in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, about 45 minutes from Charlotte. She'll be speaking at Trinity Lutheran Landis Church. So if you know anybody in Landis, which is near Charlotte, um, she's speaking there twice. So she's going to be busy traveling the next couple weekends. So just be praying for some refreshment for her. And also the time zone change just is killer. So she's going back and forth for a couple weeks. And then my last announcement is we do not have Bible study the week of Thanksgiving. So that will be our little mini fall break. So make sure that you do not show up because I'm sure that no one will be here. Um, but if you want to have some Bible study outside, you're more than welcome. Uh, as always, if you have not given to Mary Shannon Ministries and you'd like to do so, you can see me in the lobby afterwards. You can go to our website. If you missed a message, you can also catch up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, and or YouTube. So make sure that you're caught up. Share that with someone today. And I hope that you have a great rest of your Tuesday. Anybody else's allergies killing them? Because, whoo, it's a doozy. You're the third person that, whoa, I'm loud. <laughs> well, it's a new day. Oh, don't make my microphone loud. I'll turn into Amy Grant. I don't know. Uh, oh, how's everybody today? We all have allergies? That's the third person. I've heard that's just dying from allergies. I don't have that. I kind of got all kinds of other issues, but but I don't have that. Guess what? I made it to the right high school this morning. Woohoo! Yay, Shannon! Oh my goodness. I'm telling you, when that alarm went off at 5 a.m. in the morning, that does not make me happy. I wish I was like you people that, like, when I wake up like that, I'm irritated. Like, why am I awake? But um, did somebody say something to me? Amen. Amen. Yes. But, uh, it is so worth it because I'm telling you what, I got there and um, I did have a little bit of uh, triggering and I just had to overcome it because Sunrise Mountain is identical to Centennial High School, right? I mean, I knew exactly where to go because I knew everything about Centennial and Sunrise is identical. And so that I was just like, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. You're here for a job. Just do your job. But, you know, I could have just boohooed in the the courtyard, but I didn't. So I got there and I would say there's maybe 15, 20 kids there. And, um, I just started by telling them kind of a fun story, uh, just to get to know them. But then I looked at them and I said, can I ask y'all a question? I go, do you know the story of the Bible? And they all looked at me and they went, mm, no. And I said, like, if I asked you just basics, 
What is the basic story of the Bible? Could you answer me? And they all went no. So right there, I'm like, ooh, do I have some good stuff for you, right? So I'm like, okay. But I got to thinking, I was telling Cindy this morning, I cannot imagine. So you are those kids, and you come to church, okay, and you hear certain uh, topic preached or they use certain verse, and, and all of that's good, and they're trying to apply that to their lives, or someone comes to Christian club and they have like a story that has an application for them, and they take that application, right? Like, you know, the, the moral of the story, like you read any story and they try to apply it. Wouldn't it be very hard not to turn Christianity into behavior modification in that sense? That this is what someone who loves Jesus does. This, these things are what it means to be all in with Jesus. But yet, what do they not know? <laughs> yeah. they, they don't really know Jesus per se. I'm not saying they're not a Christian because I believe God judges us on the faith uh, according to which he has given us, okay? Um, but they don't really know who he is and the beautiful story of who he is and what he has done and how he has made a way and what it means to be alive in the spirit. I mean, they, they don't know any of that. So I started, I said, how about I just tell you I just start because the Lord knows I can't do it in 15 minutes. I can't tell you. The, I mean, I kind of could, right? God created everything. We messed it up, and he fixed it. I mean, I could tell you. I could tell you that, right? But um, I can't tell you the overall story. So I, I just said, so can I just get it started for you? Can I just tell you, like, the big picture items along the way? And so, I mean, I started with creation, I worked through the fall, I worked through the flood, I got him to the Tower of Babel, I got him to Abraham, which I could see the light bulbs going off in their eyes when I talked about that the same God that breathed in the nostrils of human beings is the same God that breathed into Abram and he became Abraham and that nation was a supernatural nation and became alive. And it was through that nation that he was going to bust open the doors to all nations. I mean, I could just see him. They were like, that makes total sense to me. And so I said to them, I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm like, oh, this is my lane. This is worth getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And so I said, so what do you all think? What if I come back a few times and I just tell you the story? How about that? Oh, yeah, we'd, we'd really like that. And so I was like, do I really want to do that? That means on a Tuesday morning I got to, you know. But it's so worth it. And I looked at the kid. I said, so do you have people scheduled for the next few times? He's like, yeah. He said, but how about you come back in December and start? And so I thought, that's awesome. Um, the thing I'm really bad about, I'm not good at advertising, uh, announcing things. So <laughs> two people I love said, well, did you tell them about that you teach high school on Wednesday night? And I go, no. <laughs> Didn't. Never entered my mind. No idea. I, I just don't. I just, I get focused on what I'm doing and I don't think that's why I need an assistant. I need help. But, uh, two of the, two of the kids in there come to my Bible study on Wednesday night. So now they can say, Hey, you know, that chick that came and taught you the story. She happens to teach on Wednesday nights. You can come to Bible study. Um, but so anyway, the walking out, the girl said, um, I've never seen them so engaged. And I said, you know, that's because this beautiful story, this love story, it's engaging. It's marvelous. And we were made for stories. We're made for that. that that's how we engage our children. That's how we engage. But it's how I engage you. Is I tell you sto ridiculous stories about me and what's going on. And guess what you believe? A lot of you. You're my best friends. And I love that. You know, I, I love that part. Sometimes you ask me questions you shouldn't because you think you're my best friend and you ain't. 
y'all would be shocked if I told you some of the questions I get asked. I'm like, mm, I know you think you know me that well, but you just really don't, you know? But that's what brings us together. And that's these people shared a history and a story, and we share that. And the fact is, we need to share it. We need to share the story. If you're a grandma in here, do you know the opportunity you have? You get to sit with them without all the responsibility. Well, at least I hope you are. Sometimes we have grandmas that have all the responsibility. But you get to sit with them. Guess what? Tell them the stories. Just get them started. Parents, learn the stories. Know the stories. I love all kinds of stories. I love Danny the Dinosaur. I loved, I've got an alligator under my bed. I read that to Zach all the time. But more than that, what stories do we need to tell them? We got to tell them the Bible stories. Because that is the foundation so that we can tie it all together. So that's why we come do what we do. Now, obviously, we do it a little deeper here. Like, I wish I could just come tell, well, maybe I should sometime, you know, just come tell you the story. But we get to go deeper and But I always want to back up at the 3,000-foot view and, and make sure we understand what is going on. So I hope I do that well. Anyway, good morning. Let's pray, and uh, let's jump in. Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you um, for the opportunity already this morning to share your story. You're an amazing God. You're mind-blowing. And God, sometimes... It, <laughs> It can be to teach your word. It's, it's a blessing, but in so many ways, it's heavy. It is so heavy. There are things I don't get. There are things I don't understand. There are times when I go, I don't know how to do that. As, as much as I try, Lord, I don't get that right. I, I don't know. It's exhausting sometimes, Lord, just being in your word all the time and applying it to me first. And, uh, and Lord, there are so many questions that still remain, but yet, Lord, there's no place I'd rather be. It is a must. We can't get through this life with our eyes fixed on you unless our face is in this book. And so, God, I pray that we would have a passion for it that we would make time for it because you, you still speak through it. And, um, and Lord, I cannot wait for one day just to be able to look at your face, the living word. And uh, I wish that I could have sat with you for those 40 days, but I've been sent with you for quite some time. So God, I pray that you would speak through me, that the Holy Spirit would teach here because I'm super inadequate. And I pray that uh, I would learn for myself, uh, from my own mouth, and uh, that you would speak to us through Acts 3 and 4. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read Acts 3, and um, just as a reminder, because we're like halfway through it, I'm going to start in verse 11. And I'm just going to read through it, and then I'm going to Start where we left off. It says, while he clung to Peter and John, who's he? The lame man. How long had he been lame? His whole life. How old is he? You got it, man. Y'all are good. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, people utterly astounded ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel. Why do you wonder at this, and why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy One, the Holy and Righteous One, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life. Whew whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is 
through Jesus, has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, and did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. That is an amazing sermon, may I just say. He starts off by... um, Addressing God, if you remember, we talked about that he says the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and how these are um, like hyperlinks back to the Old Testament at Passover where God introduces himself to Moses. Do you remember at the burning bush? He says, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, take off your shoes because the place you are standing is holy. And so it brings us back to the time of the Exodus, if you remember, where God has heard the cries of his people and he has sent his prophet Moses to free them from the bondage of slavery. And we have that whole picture. And so here he addresses, he's, he's bringing our eye back to that time and then pointing at Jesus, talking about Jesus, this prophet that was to come like Moses and that God is right now fulfilling promises that he, we are seeing it happen, that he is bringing them out of bondage of sin and death. And we have this whole image here. So he not only hyperlinks back by saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he also says his servant, Jesus. And didn't last week I read you Isaiah 53. The Psalm of the Suffering, uh, the suffering Servant. Um, Mark 10 45 says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Isaiah 53 was a huge chapter, a huge piece of scripture that the early believers clung to, that Jesus was that suffering servant. He was that lamb that took the penalty for their sin. Isaiah 53 points to his innocence that he was innocent. What does that remind you of in the Passover? What, was it, what, what innocent thing died? The lamb, okay? The lamb of God, the blood of that innocent lamb was put on the doorpost. Something innocent died in their place so that they could be led out. All of this undertone is in this message and it is beautiful. He says, but you denied the holy and righteous one. I mean, come on. Even the, even Pilate recognized what? That he was innocent. I mean, the Romans declared him really innocent. The thief on the other side of him says what? We deserve this. But this man, he's done nothing. He goes on to say that you, you killed the, the author of life. You were presented two scenarios. What were they? Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus Barabbas, right? Jesus, the only begotten son of the father, and Jesus, the terrorist. And who did they pick? The terrorist. 
I've also said, I've always said that the Bible could be named the tale of two seeds or the tale of two kingdoms. I was talking to the young people today about that when I talked about the first gospel, when it's promised that the seed of woman would crush the seed of the serpent. The tale of two seeds, the tale of two very distinctly different kingdoms. And before long, look what happened. Because we were made to rule, but we ruled in in our authority, we ended up at the Tower of Babel. You see this here coming in full circle because here you have this terrorist who, uh, by using violence and drawing the sword, was trying to usher in an earthly kingdom. He was, he was a zealot. Okay, And then you have Jesus who is laying down his life because he is bringing in his kingdom. And which one did they choose? The sword. They chose the guilty and they killed the innocent. And doesn't that, isn't that shocking when we think of how can we look at those examples and make right wrong and wrong right? How is that possible? It's the human condition. And so in this sermon, you see so many references to the Exodus and to Isaiah. So in the Exodus, you see God freeing those who had been enslaved. He was doing something new. In Isaiah, God's servant bearing the guilt and infirmities of his people. He was both. He is the one who freed, and how did he do it? How did he do it? By laying down his life. You killed the author of life. Some of your Bibles say the prince of life. Prince there literally means the one who initiates something. Okay, that's kind of important. Think about that. The prince of life. The one who initiates something. John 1, 4. In him was life. And that life was the light of man. Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He is the author, and he is the initiator of life. You can see that theme all through the Bible, from the breath of God breathing into Adam to make him alive, from the breath of God breathing into Abraham and make him Abraham, and you see the breath of God at Pentecost, what? What was dead, those dry bones become what? Alive. Okay, so you see it. We also see, think about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the words of life, are they not? This is how you were created to live. This is the way that brings life, life into you and life into the community. And what is that sixth commandment? Oh, come on, people. <laughs> Let's practice. Do I need to do some motions? I'll bring them next time. I, I'd have to review. I used to always make up motions to everything. Okay. Number one, love God and only God. This is a marriage deal, okay? Love me and only me. Number two, no idols. Get rid of all your old boyfriend's pictures. No images, no idols. Honor my name. Why? Because you're going to bear it. You're going to take it, okay? Make me the most important thing in your life. Give me a date date every week. Honor, keep the Sabbath, right? Five, Honor your father and mother. That's where authority, that's where all of it starts, right there. That submissive attitude. Jesus is going to submit to his authority, the father, all the way to the cross unto death. That's what he did. He lived out a life of submission to his father. He showed us what it was to be truly human, what we were created to be. He displayed the kingdom of heaven throughout his whole life. He showed us what humanity was. And so honor your father and mother. That's where it starts. Now you wonder why the breakdown of the family is such a problem. If you don't have that, it, it's a problem. 
You're going to see that come out in every aspect of life, right? Thou shalt not, this is the one I'm talking about, murder. Okay, thou shalt not murder. In one generation, when sin came, what happened? Sin was like lighting a wick on a piece of dynamite. <laughs> Bam, one brother kills another. Of course they do. It's the tale of two seeds. The enemy just heard that someone from Eve, humanity, would destroy him. There was a coming seed. So what did he do? He grasped that Cain, and Cain killed Abel. And you have already that, that murder uh, doing away with life. I mean, can you imagine the finger that pinned this knew <laughs> that when it came to the sixth commandment, what were they going to do to him? Murder. He is the author of life. He is a God of life. We should be people of life. And so he is the initiator of life, the one who pioneers the way through death, decay, corruption, and out the other side. Right? He is the leader. Psalm 16. Do you remember when we talked about that? You're like, no. Let me remind you. Do you remember when it's talking about how in the first sermon he says that David preached the message in Psalm 16 saying that God would not abandon me to the grave and that he would not let his holy one see decay? Do you remember it now? And we went back and we read 16 and basically David was saying, Lord, I trust you. I know somehow, right, that the experience I've had with you will not end at the grave. Now, did he see it clearly? No, but he knew that death did not have the last word. That is the, the point. And he said, why? Because you won't leave me in the grave. You won't abandon your Holy One to decay because you are the path of life. That's what he said. Somehow, you are the initiator of life. It is through you. You have always been before me. And if I keep you before me, death will not have the last say. Think about the faith he had. And that you will carry me through that and into life. And this is the picture. He is saying, you have killed the author of life. You put him to death. The God who led you out of Slavery in Egypt that led you through. The innocent servant of Isaiah 53. You killed him. This is what you've done. Yikes. Oh, but God. Those are the words we want to hear. This is the constant message of the apostles. Oh, but God did what? He raised him. You killed him, oh, but God raised him. A bodily resurrection, and we are the witnesses. And why do we care? Well, what does this prove? Number one, it vindicates Jesus' claims. Because what did he claim? Destroy this temple. Three days later, what? I will raise it up again. And when he was even asked about that at his trial, do you remember what he said? <laughs> they said, are you the Christ? He said, you say so, but let me tell you who I am. I am the son of man. From this moment, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. What is he saying? You will see my words vindicated because I will rise and I will ascend and I will be seated at the right hand of God the Father. His resurrection vindicated his claims, and it also uh, displayed the acceptance of the offering. Think about it. What is the penalty of sin? Death. So if he did not remain in the grave, and he bodily raised from the dead new creation, what does that mean? That death was conquered, right? It's paid for. That the offering that was given, because now there is life, the offering was accepted. And it proves that he is the source of life. And that is why we will see in this next uh, group of scriptures that it talks about that in him is the resurrection. That's huge. In him is the resurrection. 
Your faith is only as strong as what your faith is in. You need to know that. Faith for faith's sake? What does that even mean? We have faith in the person of Jesus Christ, who is God in flesh, who literally bodily conquered death and rose again, coming to life. He is the first fruits of the new creation. And the only way we will enter into that kingdom is to follow after him, to have faith in him. There is no other way. I've told you the story a hundred times. Zach was working out at Stanford and his coach, you know, was saying, oh, Zach, you believe in creation? And he's like, yeah, I believe in creation. He's like, really? He goes, you need to go take some courses, some science courses at Stanford. They're the smartest people in the world. And he said, all right, coach, I'll go take them. He said, but you need to watch the truth project. And he goes, I'm not watching that beep. And so Zach goes, oh, so you want me to have an open mind, but you don't want to have an open mind. And he's like, so coach, you believe in in millions of years that over time our genes gain knowledge. When actually within your theory, it actually says that we lose knowledge in natural selection. So you have a little bit of a conflict there. But I'll go and I'll do that science course if you take it. He's like, no, I'm not going to do that. He's like, okay. He said, it's your gamble. And he goes, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, if I'm right and you're, if you're right and I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. To be honest, the Bible really is the best way to live for community, if you look at it. It's, I mean, it's very selfless and others-oriented and, um, and, and all of that. I mean, it's, it's a community of servants, of giving and of love and all that. And so, I mean, if, if, I, if you're right and I'm wrong, oh darn, but I probably left a pretty good legacy of love. But if I'm right and you're wrong... He didn't say this. He just said, you're headed down the wrong path. But think about death. You're dead. And so he looks at me and goes, I hate you, Hoff Power. And so he walks off. He comes back later. And he says, hey, Zach, I don't want you to think I'm a Christian hater or anything. He said, you know, I am a man of faith. And Zach looked at him. He said, coach, your faith is only as good as what your faith is in. And he goes, I really hate you. And he, he walked off. And then he called me and told me, and I said, you know, you're not going to see the field on Saturday after that. You know, we laughed about it. But that is it. You, this is real. This isn't law, law, faith. This is God in flesh, bodily raised from the dead as the first fruits of a brand new creation that you're going to see has been the story all along. It's what's been promised all along. And it began at the resurrection. Our entire faith is on that. That he came up out of that grave and that he rose from the dead, that, that he rose from the dead and that he ascended to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father and he is dwelling bodily in God space. And he is waiting for that day that we're gonna look at. Can you imagine the religious leaders and their reaction? They killed him. And it hasn't stopped anything. His disciples are continuing to claim that he is risen. They are still healing, setting people free in the power of Jesus' name. And they're still claiming that he is the Messiah. Because every time they say what? In the name of Jesus, the current on the throne, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, just in case you have forgotten which one I'm talking about, right? We, we have done this in the power of his name. And so he says, this is who he is. But let's review what you've done. Bottom line, you've handed him over. You're worse than Pilate. Now, I want you to think about this. I thought about this this week. 
with all of this exodus picture in your mind, right? And we're saying that Jesus is the prophet that is to come like Moses. Go with me in this picture. Moses went to Pharaoh and said what? Let my people go. And what did he say? No. Ten plagues, Passover, Red Sea, okay? You've got all that. He said no. Well, guess what? This time, it wasn't Pilate that said no. It's God's people, right? Pilate said, I'll release him. Yes, he is innocent. But it was the people. And I, so I wrote in my notes, I'm like, Pilate was going to let him go. But you said no, crucify him. He came to deliver you, but you refused to be delivered. I am delivered in the name of Jesus. But I'm going to tell you what. Are there areas of your life, I could sit and journal about this, that I refuse to be delivered? <sighs> he said, you handed him over. You're worse than Pilate. You traded the holy and righteous one for a murder. You killed the one who gave you life. You've been ignorant and your rulers. You haven't understood the scriptures. The prophet said that Christ would suffer. When they heard that, what, I, what part of Isaiah did they think about? Isaiah 53. Go back and read it. They knew it well. The suffering servant that was to come. He keeps pointing them back to that. And then he says, Jesus fulfilled this. So here's the thing, repent, turn around, that your sins may be blotted out. Underline that in your Bible, because that is also a hyperlink. It goes back to Isaiah 43, another one of the servant songs. Let's look at it, Isaiah 43. What's the title of that? Israel's only savior. But now, thus saith the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior." I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by name, who I created for my glory, who I formed and made. I'm going to bring you back together. I'm going to bring you in to me. Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes, who are deaf, yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. Besides me, there is no Savior. I declare and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn its back? Thus saith the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I send to Babylon, and I bring them all down as refugees, even the Chaldeans and the ships in which they rejoice. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Are you hearing any repetitive language? Please tell me you are. Even if you just hear that, okay? Thus saith the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. 
Are you hearing Exodus in that? Okay. Who brings forth chariots and horses and armies and warriors. They lie down. They cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. What did Exodus show? God was doing something new. He was fulfilling promises. Now it springs forth. Do not, do you not perceive it? Do you not see he's doing something new? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. I give drink to my chosen people, the people who I'm formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burned you. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not bought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned, and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princess of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. They knew the prophets. So when he says, listen, Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew. He is the servant. He was sent to suffer. Why? He was sent so that he could blot out your transgressions. And what he is saying is he's like, there is no other one. There is no other way to be saved. There is no other name in heaven that you might be saved other than Jesus. Look at verse, well, I'm going to read this certain part back to you so that you remember it. Go back to Acts. Nineteen, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets long ago. That is is the story that has always been the story. What? What have the prophets been saying all along? What is coming? There is coming a day when God will do what? Restore all things. Where? Here. Everything they describe. He will restore Israel And by restoring Israel, he will restore all nations and he will restore his own creation. We have all that imagery. They always believed in a final resurrection. Well, some of them. All right, think about this. When Jesus raised, when he raised Lazarus, do you remember that story? And do you remember when he asks Mary if she believes? What was her response? I believed that he will be raised on the last day. All right? They believed. Okay? It's very sketchy what they believed happened after you died. All we know is it was a deep sleep, father's house. But they believed that one day what would happen? There would be a final resurrection And that God would restore all things. It's what the prophets have been preaching about forever in this final resurrection. And so what he is saying is, it says, um, 
whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouths of the holy prophets long ago. But look what it says before that. He's basically saying, and though that day will be amazing, it can be anticipated by times of what? What does it say? Repent, therefore, turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that where is the presence of the Lord? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, okay? But it is saying that if we turn, if we repent and turn back, that we will experience times of refreshing sent from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you whom heaven must receive until the time. So it is saying this, Jesus has ascended to the right hand of God the Father. They have always believed that there will be a resurrection and a restoring, but he is saying, turn now. Because you can enter into this now in the sense that you will experience refreshing coming from the Lord. So it's like this. I don't know if you've ever hiked, okay, if you've ever been on a long hike. But believe it or not, I did a stinking 25K. I couldn't run down the street right now. I'm in such bad shape. But at one point, I did a 25K in the desert, and I mean, what is that, like 17.5 miles race, okay? And I am telling you, you are so hot and so parched that when someone comes from the aid station, do you know what I'm saying? Can I tell you how good Diet Coke tastes? Like water's awesome, but when you've been sweating and, and doing all that, there is nothing better than a Diet Coke. It is so delicious, okay? It's so refreshing. It's not like if you're just hanging out at lunch and you drink a Diet Coke. No, on that day, it is the best thing you've ever seen. Can I ask you this? Like we're in a time where all things have not been made new, but it is happening inside of us. But the power of the Holy Spirit, have you ever experienced those times of refreshing? I wish I could just live in it. But the fact is, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. But God sends this Holy Spirit. We experience these times of refreshing. I've experienced it. I've experienced it through the scripture, through worship. Haven't you ever worshiped and you thought, gosh, if someone doesn't hold me down, I'm about to be levitated right on out of this place right? Some days you just want to shout. Other days you're just quiet and you want to weep. You can feel the refreshing because he is making me new. And so he is saying, turn. Um, What you're finding out is that the apostles now see every bit of their teaching in Jesus. I wish I'd have been there those 40 days that he showed them the scripture and how he was the fulfillment of scripture. But I am telling you, if you look at what they wrote, what they are telling is that now they fully understand that everything about their history, everything they have been taught about their past and every hope they have for the future, they have now realized is what? In him. Listen to this. Ephesians 1.10, I'm just going to tell you one line. It says that it is uniting all things in him. Go read those, write down these references and read them later. Colossians 1.20 says that he is reconciling all things to himself, making peace through his blood. Revelation 21 I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. It is talking about that one day, what the God space 
and, and the earthly space will be what? Restored and made one. And guess the light is going to be who? The temple is going to be who? Second Peter 3.13 says, But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28 basically says that he will overcome every power which destroys and corrupts his good creation so that eventually God will be all in all. Romans 8, 21, the whole creation will be set free from its slavery to decay to share the liberty of the glory of God's children. This was the basic Jewish belief about God as creator and judge restoring all things but now they understand it to be accomplished in Jesus. He has been resurrected. He is the first fruit of the final resurrection, the proof. He is the first one. What God is going to do to the whole creation, he has done for Jesus in raising him from the dead. N.T. Wright says this, that is why Jesus, Jesus now remains in heaven in God's spirit. Heaven is the place where God's purposes for the future are stored up, like pieces of a stage set waiting in the wings until they are needed for the final great act. When Jesus finally reappears, heaven and earth will come together as one. That will be the great renewal of all things. But Jesus is telling them they don't have to wait. If you repent, If you turn around, turn back to God, then times of refreshment can come from the very presence of the Lord himself. Wow. This is what he's telling them. Do you understand this is the same Peter in the Gospels? The same Peter who one moment said, uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and in the next moment says, oh, there's no way you're going to go to the cross. Nope, nope. And Jesus says what? Get away from me, say, right? This is that, Peter. Do you understand the transformation that has happened in them? The aha moments that they understand. And he is preaching a sermon and he is drawing them back. Do you see this? Do you see this? This is who he was. Do you see it? He is the resurrection and the life. That is who he is. So he pulls out the big guns. He doesn't just use Isaiah. He uses Moses. He uses Samuel. Who was Samuel? Oh, come on. Samuel was a transitional figure between the judges and the monarchy. Okay, he was the anointer of the kings. Remember that. He was the king anointer. All right, he was a priest, he was a prophet, and he was the last judge. So he was the beginning kind of of the prophets uh, through the kings. So he's taking that whole era. Then he goes back to Abraham. So he tells them all about the prophets, and then he goes, let's just go back to the start. What did Abraham say? In your seed, all nations will be blessed. Let's read the last part. In your seed, all nations will be blessed. Peter's trying to show them how their whole historical narrative points to Jesus and his resurrection. The great restoration to come when all would be put right at last. It's happening in Jesus, in his resurrection, the good news. And in your offspring shall all families of the earth be blessed. God, God, having raised up his servant, there it is again, sent him to you first to bless you. By turning every one of you to your wickedness. What has he told them? Even now, you stinking arrested him, handed him over, cried for his death. You the Romans killed him. You killed him. Oh, but God raised him. This is who this has been all along. He is our hope, what we have been hoping for. And guess what? Even now, his arms are wide open for you. Even now, you may repent. Even now, he's coming to you first. What does that mean? 
When it says I'm coming to you first, you assume that he's going to go to others next, which was a mystery they never saw coming. That the Gentiles, holy smokes, would be included in this thing? You know? Yes, through their seed, the seed promised all the way from Genesis chapter 3, the one I told the high schoolers about. I will put hatred between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. He was the coming seed. He was the king. You killed him, oh, but God. Raised him from the dead. He made a new way. How did he do it? He laid down his life. He won by dying. And he is now seated on the throne. He is life. He is the resurrection and the life. Turn around. Repent. You still have a chance. He has come to you first. And you would think that that kind of message... And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. What was the response? They were annoyed. How are you annoyed by that message? Right? Well, we're going to look at that next week. It's very interesting. The religious leaders are annoyed. The common man, what happens? Cheat and look forward. How many? And the number goes to 5,000. It grows, right? We are going to look at those religious leaders, um, and we're going to go through chapter 4, which... Now, do you notice that I'm moving a lot more? I'm, I'm fast. Okay, we're, we're doing good. Um, yeah, I'm Speedy Gonzalez now. And we're going to see that now they are going to be arrested. Okay, sometimes we read that chapter and we act like it's no big deal because we already know what's going to happen. Did they? Who just arrested them? The same people who arrested Jesus, and what happened to him just a month or so before? Okay, this is no little thing. And what I want you to do when you read chapter 4 this week, because I want you to read it, all right? Because if you don't read it, if you're not familiar with it, when I take parts out and I'm just pulling it, you're like, whoa, what, I, I, where is she? Okay, but if you read it every day, what, that chapter every day, the terminology that I use when I quote it, you're going to go, yep, yep says servant, like in chapter three, you should have highlighted servant. It's in there twice. I think you highlight suffering and highlight blotted out your sin. All that's Isaiah. All right. And then you get to go back and look at that, but read it over and over because we're going to look. It is incredible. The boldness of Peter when he is standing before these religious leaders who just killed Jesus in the most brutal way. Listen, he's not the same. Something has happened. He is completely transformed and he's transformed because he is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus has risen from the dead. That's why. And we're gonna look at that and we're gonna see the sermon or the defense he gives these religious leaders, right? What do we know about this? The message of Jesus. Some can be annoyed, which always surprises me. And others will be what? Changed. I've never understood how someone could look and realize that the God who created them who loves them, and we screwed it up, and he was unwilling to let us go, and he pursued us through all these years, staying faithful to the most stiff-necked group of people for all of us to bring a seed 
who would come and pay the penalty for my sin and that he would conquer death and that he would be the first fruits of a new beginning. He would show us it's happening. You know why it's, look at me. I'm the first one. And I am seated at the right hand of God the Father, and through you the message is going out. But one day, I'm going to make it real. I'm coming back. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. All in one moment, everything will be made right. Man, I can't wait for that. How about you? But until then, aren't you so glad that if we lean in, we will have time of refreshment? In the hottest race of your life, when you least expect it, someone will show up with a Diet Coke that you cannot even imagine how good it is. All right? Don't be so parched. You won't last. You won't last. You have got to get your face in the book. It's, it's awesome. Lord, thank you so much for today. I thank you for Peter's boldness. I thank you for the full scripture, all of it. It's like a treasure hunt. It's so deep. Every time you look into it, you just see something else of this beauty, this narrative that you have written. It's the greatest love story ever. Lord, I don't know how people live without the hope of the great resurrection. I don't. I long for that. Lord, nothing else can fix it. When we look at it, I, uh, politics will never fix it. Wars will never fix it. It is the heart. The heart had to be removed. The heart of stone had to be removed, and you had to give us a heart of flesh with your principles, your precepts, your life written on it. God, may we lean into that. Guard our hearts, Lord. I sure love you in Jesus' name. Amen.